Why is 40k this hard? channel if you're new here my name is Liam I'm one half of deploymentzone.tv and uh, this is my review of Codex Death Guard the newest codex released by Games Workshop I say released at the point in which this video goes live it's been on pre-order for three days because I'm sticking to my Tuesday releases like I promised so this one up for preview uh, for pre-order sorry on Saturday um, and my embargo lifts at 10 o'clock on Saturday, so this is fine to put this up now. But I'm not going to break the mould of doing every Tuesday video. I need this to be regular, regular scheduled content. So when I have new codexes, I will kick them up on Tuesdays, or put them up on Tuesdays. Kick them up, put them up on Tuesdays. The bonus to that is normally, uh, before the embargo lifts on the Saturday, we normally have a couple of days maximum to sort of get our reviews ready and get them up in time for that lift. Um... Because I'm sticking to Tuesdays, it gives me a few more days to try and digest some of the codex rules, see some of the other reviews in case of things that I've missed. And, I, and what I want to do is try and put together a proper actual review. So instead of just reading the rules in the codex, give you a review of how I think this might fit in the world of 40k. So I've had the Death Guard Codex for a little under a week now and I've skim read the rules. I haven't got through the narrative type stuff yet. And I've got to say that as codexes go... I'm quite impressed by this, so those of you that know Death Guard from 8th edition, there is some similar feel to how they played in 8th, but there is also quite a significant number of changes. So to sort of briefly recap the 8th edition rule set for Death Guard, they were pretty tough and pretty resilient. They had a rule called Disgustingly Resilient, they've still got that rule, but it's changed slightly. Um, but they did tend to struggle a little bit with the maneuverability and some damage output, and I think with this new codex that has changed quite substantially, so... I think they're almost as resilient, maybe to some extent slightly less resilient than they were, resilient than they were before. But they definitely have an improved damage output and actually improved mobility uh, comparatively to the last Codex, which is an absolute massive thumbs up for them compared to where they were in 8th edition. Now what I will do is I will link just above here the video that I put up last week which gave... Um, gave some information on some of the new rules changes to the Death Guard Codex which came from the community page. Um, I will cover some of them in this review, but on the off chance that I don't get to all of them, they are covered in that particular video as well. Um, and thank you, massive, massive thank you for the support that video received as well. That was amazing. Um, so that'll be linked above if I've worked out how to do YouTube cards. And if I haven't, then it, I'm just pointing at the ceiling for nothing. Someone someone's up there. So there are some changes to how you put your list together with the Death Guard Codex. This is something that we've already seen with the Space Marine book and with the Necron Codex. Games Workshop are working really hard at the moment, I think, to put some sort of narrative spin on how you build your lists, even if you're building them competitively. And this is something that I'm a massive fan of, having seen it previously. So you can't take three captains in a Space Marine book with your three HQ slots in a battalion detachment. A single detachment can only have a single captain. The same is said for Necrons and things like Overlords. And I'm really behind this. I think this is a this is a definitely a positive way to go in terms of list building and restricting some of the things that we saw previously. Um, you obviously won't see Blood Angels list with three Smash Captains now as their three HQ slots and that's nothing but positive as far as i'm concerned and there's a narrative spin to it so i'm definitely a fan of that uh, death guard is no different so they've They've, they've made some changes to how you put your list together. For example, you can only have uh, one Lord of the Death Guard in each Death Guard detachment, which is like a Lord of Contagion or something similar, Death Guard Chaos Lord. And you can only have a maximum of one Demon one demon Prince in Death Guard detachment, so you can't have three Demon Princes as, you, as your HQ choices in your battalion. You can only have one. One Demon Prince, one Lord of the Death Guard in your HQ slots for a single detachment. Take a second detachment, you can take a second Lord of the Death Guard, but you need a second detachment to do that. Additionally, they have a new rule called Diseased Minions, and Diseased Minions basically states that you can only have a unit of Poxwalkers or a unit of Chaos Cultists for every Bubonic Astartes Core Infantry Unit, mouthful, Core Infantry Unit in your army. So what's a Bubonic Astartes Core Infantry Unit? Basically Plague Marines and Blight Lord Terminators. I think it's thereabouts where it lands. I think... I don't think Death Shroud a core. We'll have a look in a minute. But essentially, if you want to take a unit of box walkers, you have to have a Bubonic Astartes core infantry unit, i.e. a unit of Plague Marines or a unit of uh, Blight Lord Term Terminators. They give an example, and I'm going to read the example out word for word because it, it sort of makes it a little bit clearer. And it says, if a detachment includes two Plague Marine units and one Blight Lord Terminator unit, it can also include up to three Death Guard Cultists and up to... 
Death Guard cultist units and up to three Death Guard Poxwalker units. So uh, even if you have one Bubonic Astartes unit, you can take a unit of cultists and a unit of poxwalkers. What you can't do clearly is take two units of poxwalkers. You would need another Bubonic Astartes core infantry unit. Real, real, real fan of that. I think that's amazing. There's something else that they've done, which isn't we haven't really seen it before. We kind of saw it in the Necron Codex, but I, otherwise we haven't. I know this is very early on in 9th edition releases. Is a rule called Fetid Virion. And Fetid Virion basically means that their special characters that they have, things like the... Um, not the malignant playcaster, he's a HQ choice. Things like the Tallyman, the Biologist Putrefire, the Foul Blightspawn, they all have this Fetid Virion rule. And the Fetid Virion rule basically states that for every elite slot, you can fill it with three of these types of models. The specific requirement is that they have to be different, so you can't take three Tallymen in one elite slot when you're using the Fetid Virion rule. Um, something that I spoke about on the Conclave podcast, if you haven't checked out the Conclave podcast, check out the Conclave, the Conclave 40k podcast, it's on iTunes and Spotify and all those kinds of things. What I spoke about it there, I'll be interested to know whether, if you want to take three Tallymen, you can do that in three separate elite choices, or whether you're going to have to take a Tallyman, a Noxious Blight Bringer, a, a uh, blight spawn and then you've got one field and then you can take a second tally man it, that'll be interesting i'm pretty sure that if you wanted three tally men you could just use three hq slots and this just allows you to put more characters in but one of the real restricting factors for these characters in eighth edition was that the elite slots was filled by other things like blight lord terminators and therefore you didn't have sometimes enough slots to chuck in all of these special characters and now you can do that fetid virin allows you to do that without taking up elite slots Huge boon in my in my book. I think that's amazing. I like it. And then they've got an inexorable advance, which we spoke about in the last video. What you can also do now is you can organise your detachments as per plague companies, and there's seven plague companies to choose from. So you can choose for one whole detachment to be from a specific plague company if you want to. And basically what you do is you gain access to a warlord trait, a stratagem, and a relic of some sort. The big one that I think almost everybody was interested in was the relic from the Poxmongers, something that in 8th edition gave an aura 4-up and vulnerable save to all demon engines within a certain range. This has now been changed. Iron Clock Furnace is now a single demon engine within 6 inches of the bearer gains that 4 plus and vulnerable save, so quite a nerf there, but again, I think that's probably worth doing if we're honest. In terms of stratagems, the Death Guard Codex has had quite the overhaul from the 8th edition version, and if this is a sign of things to come for the Chaos book, I'm quite excited. Although there's some things that have been lost that that sting. Vets of the Long War has gone for a single command point, that's disappeared. There's now an equivalent type stratagem that does the same sort of thing, but it's two CPs instead of one. Um, Blight Bombardment has changed quite significantly. Uh, Cloud of Flies has changed quite significantly. You now do it in the opponent's shooting phase, which is a bonus, but if you wanted to put that on a unit of, ter unit of Terminators, it costs four command points instead of instead of one command point. On a unit of normal Astartes, it's two command points. But on the whole, I think the stratagem changes up, change ups are pretty good. Um, they've gained some normal ones that you've seen in the past where you can have an additional wall or trait, an additional relic, and there's ways that you can now put those sorts of relics on champion models instead of just um, instead of just HQ models, which is again very very good. Um, we've lost, we haven't lost. The chaos boon table has been moved. So something I really loved before was the chaos boon table, and for a single command point, if you defeated a character, you could roll on the boon table and gain a boon. That's disappeared out of the core rules now for normal play, and is only included in the crusade system um, so that's an interesting change otherwise it's out of the stratagems what i will say having skimmed through the stratagems is most of them are pretty good i don't think i found one that i've, that I've looked at and gone that's completely useless and it would never be used um, there's ways of dishing out multiple mortal wounds and i'm not going to go over the stratagems but if you want an in-depth look at the stratagem from the death guard codex then linked below is the video on deploymentzone.tv where Winters spent an hour looking at Death Guard Codex. And I remember, if I remember rightly, he basically read through every single stratagem in the book. Um, and that's your gateway into getting hold of all of the stratagems before the book is released to you good people on Saturday. Another new thing that sits within the Death Guard Codex is a rule called Deadly Pathogens, um, something that I, I really love. And again, I think this is kind of Games Workshop's way of bringing these books up to almost being level with things like Space Marines. So Space Marines at the moment you can pay extra points or power level to upgrade certain characters to be chief of chief apothecaries or master of sanctuaries or whatever they're called the loyalist scum that they are um and in this book you have deadly pathogens and deadly pathogens there's something like seven i think is there seven it would be really fluffy is there seven there is seven and if you pay for a deadly pathogen you can pick one of your characters 
and you can give him this pathogen and it affects a plague weapon of your choice that's not a relic or a grenade weapon and basically it gains plus one strength and an additional rule depending on which you pick. There's seven to choose from like I say they do various things like they could um, improve your armor penetration characteristic of that weapon or it can allow you to re-roll the random number of hits. Um, each time an attack is made with this weapon the target does not receive the benefit of cover etc etc and all of them do that plus one strength as well so you get that plus one strength and you get this additional rule and they range anything from 10 to 20 points so they're not particularly expensive really really positive move this because you can do it a few times if i remember rightly and um, what well, can you only do it once this will be interesting oh, wait a minute yeah so you can upgrade any death guard character or bubonic astartes models in a death guard detachment as long as you're paying the points that's really positive so there's no there's no limit on it you could give it to every single character and champion model in your army the only caveat being you have to give them a different pathogen each time so once you've hit your seven pathogens you can't then upgrade an eighth character nor can you take the same pathogen twice and i think that's positive because there's that little bit of uniqueness and it stops things that are quite strong being spammed. So the Warlord traits have seen a slight overhaul. Um, some of the reasons is because other core rules have changed and some of them because I think maybe they weren't so good before and they've improved them. So one of the ones that comes to mind is Revoltingly Resilient which was used tons in 8th edition. Probably not the most used Warlord trait but was certainly used quite a lot. Now because Disgustingly Resilient has changed and if you haven't, if you're watching this review and you don't yet know that Disgustingly Resilient has changed you must have had your head deep 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 in the sand. But instead of having a feel no, five up feel no pain per point of damage for disgustingly resilient, it's now minus one damage for any successful wound roll that is hit against your unit. So uh, if they roll for three damage, you take two. If it's a flat two damage, you take one, etc. So revoltingly resilient used to improve that disgustingly resilient five up feel no pain save to a four up. Now it doesn't do that. Now it gives you that five up feel no pain save. Uh, a point to note: Mortarian has revoltingly resilient, so he has the minus one damage, a four up invulnerable save because that's what he has. But he also has has a 5 up for no pain on a now toughness 8 18 wound creature which is pretty disgusting he also has two other warlord traits he has arch contaminator and living plague arch contaminator has changed and i think this is this is a positive change as well so it used to be that you could reroll all wounds for all plague weapons that were in range of your warlord now that's true of melee plague weapons but for ranged plague weapons the enemy has to be within 12 inches for you to get that reroll to wound which makes sense when you think about the plague in the stench that exudes from these people it doesn't make sense that you can fire your plague weapons from 60 70 80 inches away or whatever it was and they still get the reroll to wounds it doesn't seem to work for me uh, living plague which is the third one we spoke about Montarian having, is a really, really nice Warlord trait, in my opinion. Everything within three inches of the Warlord can't uh, benefit from any auras, um, with the exception of psychic powers. I uh, like that, shutting auras down. Again, it sort of makes sense that people are suffering and choking and suffocating, and they can't cope with the, the stench and the disease that's upon them, so it's hard for them to concentrate and be real battle sharp. Uh, the other three, we've got Rotten Constitution, Foul Effulence, and Hulking Physique. Hulking Physique... Uh, is another wound and it gives you basically transhuman physiology so one to th one to three won't wound your warlord uh, which is good rotten constitution is adding one to your warlord's toughness characteristic and armor penetrations of minus one or minus two count as zero you can see how these are all actually pretty strong warlord traits and then foul effluence basically at the end of your movement phase roll a d6 for the unit any units within six inches uh, and on a four plus it suffers a mortal wound I think that's something we used to sort of see from Lord of Contagions and stuff in 8th edition now as a Warlord trait. I really like it. Um, and there's the other seven play companies have also got Warlord traits. So you haven't got six to pick from. You've got 13 Warlord traits to pick from. And those base six, I mean, let's face it, they're pretty good. Now, like I said, Mortarion's got three, and he has an additional rule now which allows him to take a fourth Warlord trait. And that fourth Warlord trait is just one of the seven play companies, the one that you choose that's a pretty big deal that he gets that as well. Now, Relics is the one area in the Death Guard book that personally I'm not blown away by and I think is mildly disappointing. It's only a single page of Relics and maybe they've tried to be... Have they tried to... Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They've not even tried to be fluffy. Not even seven Relics. There's eight Relics. So I thought maybe I could live with there being one page of Relics Games Workshop if there were seven of them because seven is Nurgle's famed number. But no, there's eight. So that's disappointing, isn't it? 
but there's just nothing that blows me away. And of these eight relics, half of them are specific to a certain type of character. So really there's four usable for your captain. Winters has said on it on his in-depth review that the separating plate, which gives them a safe characteristic of two plus, and each time an enemy unit fights after it makes its attacks, if the bearer lost any wounds as a result of those attacks, roll one D6 on a two plus or suffers a mortal wound. I don't think it's that great anymore, if I'm honest. The two that I quite like are the Plague Skull of Gl Glothilia. Glothilla? Um, insert word um, once per battle at the end of your movement phase the bearer can use the relic if it does select one unit within six inches of the bearer and roll seven d6s for each four to a five it suffers a mortal wound and for each six plus it suffers d3 mortal wounds I really like that and the other thing that I can, the other one that I can see being used quite frequently is Fulgaris' helm which again just adds three inches to the range of certain characteristics of the bearer's aura abilities and when you consider the contagion ability that we're going to go on to soon and some of the other abilities that exist within the Death Guard Codex that are quite short range the Plague Surgeon gives out a six up feel no pain now but it's only a three inch range you could chuck the helm on him and your six up feel no pain becomes a six inch range and then you're taking minus one damage from disgust and resilient and you've got a six up feel no pain that's quite strong i think the helm is probably the strongest one now because of its versatility but we'll see i'm not blown away by them they're not amazing but it's a relic and it's free and are we going to complain too much probably not to be honest with you the Contagion Discipline compared to the 8th edition codex has been tweaked ever so slightly. So there's some slight changes to some of the psychic powers. A couple have had a bit more of an overhaul. Uh, the two most famous, Miasma of Pestilence and Putrescent Vitality, both exist and are basically exactly the same. Apart from, I think, Putrescent Vitality was a warp charge value of 6, if I remember rightly, now it's 7. Um, but they basically do the same thing. Some of the others are okay, not too bad. Um, there's a lot of mortal wounds kicking out actually in this edition, which is quite nice from Death Guard. Lots of ways of kicking out mortal wounds, which obviously sort of for the narrative that kind of represents the plague and the disease that they're spreading. So I like it. The discipline is pretty strong. You probably see the same two that you always saw before. And there's a massive section on Crusade, which I'll be honest, I haven't really looked at at all to be honest with you i know you can create your own disease and you can create your own vector um and they don't create one that spreads across the whole of the globe that's a disease that's spread by coughing and sneezing and don't do that don't but like i said the chaos boon table exists within the uh, crusade area as well it doesn't exist now in the normal rules i say the normal rules crusade is normal rules but you get what i mean the everyday rules that people use for death guard the ones that you'll see at events and tournaments because people can't use crusade rules those rules do not ex do not include chaos boon tables it does make me sad it'll make stylus from dz tv really sad i'm sorry stylus but hey ho that's that's that that happens it's a thing and then we move on to the data sheets and some core abilities that Death Guard have got. So Plague Weapon, no different. You reroll ones to wound. That's how it was in 8th edition anyway. I don't think we expected that to change. They gain a, a rule called Remorseless, which basically means there's no modifiers for combat attrition tests. Really, really key. It doesn't feel like it's going to be a big deal, but I think that when Harlequins drop and people like Nirds come out, we're probably going to see lots of leadership debuffing and modifiers to combat attrition tests that exist that mean that should you fail your morale check, it's significantly more painful for you. Well, they ignore all those modifiers, so they're always failing on a standard combat attrition test. I'm interested to know whether that will affect if they're less than half strength, because strictly I think less than half strength combat attrition test, is that a modifier or is that a base roll of one or a two and you run away? Mm, that'd be interesting, because if it stops that, that's actually really strong. Malicious Volleys is in the codex, and that's the same as Bolt Discipline for all you normal people. Um, it's not a surprise, it's the same thing. So you get to fire your bolt weapons twice at full ballistic skill if you're stood still, basically. Or you or you can use your rapid fire ability at full at full distance if you stand still. What's important is with an exolerable advance, uh, Death Guard infantry units, unless they fell back or advanced, um, they they always count as being stationary, so you always get full range rapid fire bolter guns even on the move, which makes them quite frightening when you think they have a five inch move base and you've always got 24 inches with rapid fire weapons. That's that's quite punishing. Um, it's quite nice and it's better than they used to be where they only had that 18 inch range, so that's better. And then we've got Disgustingly Resilient, which we know, because I've described already, is minus one to a damage. And then finally, we've got the Contagions of Nurgle ability, which from battle round one onwards, you're kicking out a contagion. And battle round one is an inch, two, three, 
3 is 6 inches and 4 is 9 inches. And the contagion ability basically means that enemy units within contagion range are minus 1 toughness. And this has got to be, I think, I think I said it on my last video, I'm sure I said it on the podcast, it's got to be one of my favourite changes to Death Guard rules because I just think it's so incredibly narrative. A point to note, there are modifiers to that contagion range as well. So people like Typhus gain 3 inches. Mortarion always counts as battle round 4, so I fall 9 inches. There's some amazing little tweaks you can put in there. Uh, if you think that someone with a Folgaris's helm um, would then count as an additional 3 inches. So I think a Lord of Contagion also gets plus 3 inches like Typhus does. You give him the Folgaris's helm, that's plus plus six inches, he's got a seven inch contagion range from battle round one, 10 inches from two, 12 inches from three, and you can't go higher than 12 at that point. That's really tasty. This is why I think the helm is probably gonna be the more powerful relic for the Death Guard. And then we move into the data sheets, and there's some tweaks and changes here and there. Demon Princes have gone up to six attacks, but they don't get plus three attacks for dual claws. Prefer it, it means you can take the ax or the sword, and you have a higher level of base attacks anyway. That's really, really nice. Uh, they also have a Lord of Death Guard, Aura, which so does Typhus and the Lord of Contagion and others, which is reroll hit rolls of one for friendly units within six inches. So you don't have to pick a unit, you just reroll units, rolls of one for units within six inches. Really like that. Typhus has had a bit of an overhaul, so he's quite a monster now, and he has host of the destroyer hive, and you can do things like cause mortal wounds in your command phase. So you select a unit within six inches in your command phase, roll a d6. On a two plus, it suffers d3 mortal wounds. So he's kind of got like a cheap free smite that happens in his command phase, but the range is like six inches. That's I think that's really cool. I like it. Um, he also has a new rule with his Mastercrafted Man Reaper where he can cleave or scythe it. And cleave is plus three strength, and scythe is plus one strength, and cleave is three damage and minus three AP, and scythe is one damage and minus one AP. But scythe is two hits for every hit roll of a one instead, so his six attacks become 12 attacks. That's something that's also happened with Death Shroud. Mortarion had it in the past anyway, still got it. Really, really positive move that units like Typhus can swing that Man Reaper and now it doesn't get bogged down quite so much by single model units of like cultists and stuff, for example, that might in the past have bogged him down and he could kill three or four. Now he's taking on 12 time. Really, really like that. Massive, massive boon to him, I think. That's actually a more of a positive change than people know. And his base attacks have gone up. Something that I've noticed in the whole of the Death Guard Codex, Death to the False Emperor has disappeared, which makes me super sad. But so is Hateful Assault, which makes my World Eaters really concerned. Hateful Assault has disappeared as well. But what they have seemed to have done in this codex is all the base attacks of all the models have gone up anyway. So I don't mind losing Hateful Assault too much if the base attacks have increased, because you get that then, whether you've charged, whether you were charged, or even whether you're just stuck in melee. So I'm now I'm really hoping Berserkers have a high, higher number of attacks base. Because that would be really arrogant. I'd, I'd quite love that. And then in the HQ slots, there's a couple of other big changes. So we've got the Lord of Virulence, who's a new unit with a Master Crafted or a Twin Plague Spewer, which is a heavy 2d6 flamer. Um, he is... He's really good, actually. He's got quite a lot of decent rules. He's, he's sort of normal Death Guard Toughness 5. He's a six-wound character. He's got like a power fist type thing on him. He's Lord of the Death Guard. And he has a Master of Destruction aura. So while friendly play company core units within six inches of him each time the model in the unit makes a range attack with a plague weapon and an unmodifying wound roll of six, you can improve the armor penetration characteristic by one. So they're bolt weapons. You can make them plague weapons of a stratagem and they can reroll wind rolls of a one. And then if they're within six inches of him and that's a plague weapon... And they roll a six to wound, they become AP minus one. And there's some combinations you can do there that make just the standard bolter on a Plague Marine really quite frightening. Which, considering now you have to have a bubonic Corastartes infantry unit in your army if you want access to Poxwalkers and Cultists, which means that almost every Death Guard unit now you're going to see some kind of core Astartes infantry unit, whether that be uh, Blight Lords or Plague Marines, you're going to see one at least. Because actually, you're going to have to see more than one aren't you because if you see just a single unit of blight lord terminators you can only take one unit of cultists one unit of pox walkers and you need three to fill a battalion so when you consider this rule and some of the other rules that they have in terms of stratagems that they can combine with their bolt weapons you'll see you're going to see some frightening some frightening astartes chaos units on the tabletop for death guard and i really hope they do the same with chaos space rooms and with the thousand suns because i think that's a real positive move pushing people not only towards using the astartes but giving them benefits for doing that, I'm a massive, massive fan of this. I think it's brilliant. Otherwise, we've got Death Guard Chaos Lords and Death Guard Chaos Sorcerers. Importantly, the Sorcerer is only in Terminator armor, which seems like a strange choice to me. But, I mean, it's better than not having a Death Guard Chaos Sorcerer, because in the old uh, Death Guard Codex, it was just a plain Sorcerer. In this one, he gets plus one toughness, and he gets Disgusting Resilience, same as the Chaos Lord, and you get the Chaos Lord in Terminator armor as well. That's a real positive now that they're 
Death Guard, Chaos Laws and Sorcerers are actually Death Guard rather than just sort of on attachment, hanging out on holiday in Barbarous or something. So Plague Marines are now insanely cheap at 21 points per model. Um, For what they get with their disgustingly resilient minus one damage and being toughness five and now having two wounds and having two, two attacks each, that's really impressive. Importantly now, you can't take two special weapons per five like you used to, so you could run a squad of five and take two of the blight launchers you can't do that anymore it's only one per five two per ten so if you have ten you can take two if you've got seven you can take one i'm unsure whether i like that change or not i i think that was nice fluffy nod to allowing you to take units of seven and have two special weapons i liked that but I don't think it's going to make a huge difference. Otherwise, Pox Walkers are down at five points per model. They did lose the old Disgusting Resident rule because there's no point having the new one because it's minus one damage and they only single win models anyway. But they still have Unending Horde, which is a six up for no pain. And their base toughness has been pushed up to four up. So instead of being a three up, to, uh, sorry, instead of being a th uh, toughness three with a five up for no pain, they're toughness four with a six up for no pain. I think that increases their survivability. I think that makes them better. Um... I, I don't know if it does or not because I haven't run the math on it. There was a video actually on Hellstorm Wargaming about math hammering that change and I don't know if he included the 6-up photo pain because I'm not sure if we've been told about that yet but there has been some of this topic covered already by other channels so you can check out Hellstorm Wargaming for his math hammer on the difference between Toughness 4 Poxwalkers without a 5-up and Toughness 3 Poxwalkers with a 5-up. But down at 5 points, I think we're still going to see them. Big shambling hordes of them and don't forget they also have the Contagions of Nurgle ability which is pretty decent so you can still put um, putrescent vitality no it's not putrescent vitality there's one of the powers you can put on them which gives them another plus one toughness to make them plus toughness five again I, I still think we'll see them there's a lot of rage in the internet about pox walkers and having looked at them looked at their points costs and where they sit within the book I still think we'll see a staple diet of pox walkers for lots of death guard players um, there's also stratagems where you can spend a command point and you roll 7d6 and on four pluses you gain pox walkers back and you can put them in engagement range there's some little tricks and nasty things you can do with pox walkers you're still going to see them almost all of the special type characters have seen a type of change whether it be the blight racks aura or the plague surgeon the plague surgeon is now basically an apothecary so he gives a six up foil pain to everything within three inches and he can heal d3 wounds on a model within three inches and stuff like that so that's um that's not too bad. That's good because it's aligning the Death Guard more in line with the Marines that get these strong rules. And I and I like that because it balances it a little bit more. It worries me that they lose some sort of flavour, a little bit of flavour, but I don't think it's a massive, massive, massive problem. Mm, not sure. I mm, I don't know. There's lots of combinations there, though. So Tallymans can give plus one to hit in combat, I think it is. The Putrefiers are still offer the opportunity to improve your Blight, blight Grenades. The Blight Grenades can have an armor penetration characteristic of minus one and be two damage now. There's some changes in there. They're, they're quite nice. Um, they're still quite flavorful for Death Guard, I think. And don't forget, you can now take three per elite slot, so there's no real reason not to take them. Um, and you've got the guy with the, the Winter's point that I saw in his Codex review, the Foul Blight spawn with his Stinking Flamer, and you can put something on him that allows you to reroll the random number of attacks for his Stinking Flamer. That now, that's now a flat seven damage, a flat seven strength, AP minus three and two damage. Like it, that's good. Um, yeah, the characters are decent. They haven't really changed. What you've probably noticed when I skip through the troops' choices is there's no plague bearers anymore. And what they've done is, with the exception of things like um, possessed and more of things like demon engines, the stuff that historically was heretic Astartes, all the demons codex stuff has gone from the book. Um, and that's a real positive change for me because it was muddying the waters in 8th edition because you couldn't include them in a detachment without losing your detachment benefits, which meant them kind of pointless being there. Um, and some would say that they were helpful for being there because of summoning, but summoning is gone as well. There's no summoning. And summoning was messy. It was introduced as a mechanic at the start of 8th edition. We realised that people had the opportunity to summon for days with certain units and then just flood the board and never lose. So summoning then cost you reinforcement points. And at the point in which summoning cost you reinforcement points, I think they kind of killed it. So I don't think it was needed, and I think they've tidied the codex up by taking it out. Again, I think that's a positive change. We move on to Blight Lords and Death Shroud, and um, they're disgusting. A Blight Lord Terminator is based 40 points now for a three wound Toughness 5 Terminator that has a four plus invulnerable save and has minus one damage for every attack that comes in. That is 
horrendously good in my personal opinion. I think we will see lots of people running Blight Lord Terminators because they're just so good. And they've changed the rules around the Cataphraki armor as well. So it used to be that you used to half the half the round when you would half the dice roll when you advanced and round up. That's gone. So there's none of that slowing down anymore. And don't forget again, part of an exolerable advance that we explained in the last video is you don't suffer the penalty to any of your move, advance or charge rolls for these models anymore so they've gained movement it doesn't sound like they have but they have gained movement they have a five inch base move um, i think they used to be a four inch base move they have a five inch base move and now when they advance they can move that full distance as well real positive for the blight lord terminators and i think that for me personally i think they were good anyway so that's amazing. Death Shroud of Free Wounds, um, and they have their Man Reapers that have the same as Typhus now, so they have the uh, Cleave and the Scythe profile. And, it, you know, being Strength 7 with the with the Cleave profile doesn't sound like a lot, but when you consider that they'll be in Contagion range, so the target they're swinging their massive Man Reaper at, it sounds a bit kinky, the target that they're swinging their massive Man Reaper out is also going to be at minus one toughness. So they're wounding things like Imperial Knights, on fours, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. That's huge. I don't think people are maybe taking this into consideration. That if they're swinging this at a tank that's toughness seven, they're wounding them on threes because they're in contagion range. And not only are they wounding them on threes, it's a plague weapon. They're re-rolling ones as well. Yeah. Uh, I really like Death Shroud. They have a bodyguard aura, which uh, when a friendly Death Guard character unit has a wound characteristic of nine or less is within three inches, models cannot cut target that character with ranged attacks. Ignore snipers, even snipers. Nope, can't do it because of the bodyguard rule. What's interesting is they seem to have lost the rule that allows them to protect Mortarion, and I thought Death Shroud's sole purpose in life was to protect the Primarch. Not sure I'm happy about that change because it's not really narrative, but meh. Hellbrutes are have the sort of not but Hellbrutes don't this is a really weird one, right? This is something that I don't understand why Games Workshop have overcomplicated this, except for maybe to draw it in line with the Chaos Space Marine Codex, but they don't have they don't have disgustingly resilient. They do have monstrous resilience each time an attack is allocated to this model, subtract one from the damage character damage characteristic. I don't know why they wouldn't have just written disgustingly resilient on this profile for a Death Guard Hellbrute. It's the same thing. Why overcomplicate it? Why have the same rule written two different ways in the same codex? That was a stupid move, Games Workshop. Good book, stupid move. And then we move on to the standard Death Guard sort of demon engines, and we have things like the Mephitic Blight Haulers and the Fetid Bloat Drones and the Plague Burst Crawlers. Now, Blight Haulers have gained a wound, um, but they've gone up a lot of points. I think they're 140 points each now, and they've lost some of their key rules that I think made them really good. There was an Auras that gave things either minus one to hit or gave them the benefit of cover. I can't remember which, exactly which one it was. They've lost some of that stuff, but they do have the new multi melter rule, and the important thing for all the Demon Engines... Yay! This is a really positive move. So you ruin it with the Hellboot special rule, and then you fix it with this. Demon Engines are now all Ballistic Skill 3. Um, and the ones that have melee are also weapon skill 3. And that makes me so supremely happy. That's an incredible move and definitely something that should have been like that right from the start. Um, so I'm okay with that. It will be interesting to see how the Blight Haulers work now because lots of them used to run the trilobes and run three of them. Um, and you gained a bonus for running three of them because you got plus one to hit. But you don't need that bonus anymore because you get the plus one to hit naturally now because your base weapon skill 3+. I think they're still pretty decent, but they are expensive, and there are people out there that have commented on my previous videos that have said that actually the points value may have killed them. Interesting. The bloat drone, however, that's dropped a wound, which sounds negative because it's one wound less, but it takes one less damage every time, and importantly, it now no longer has a degrading profile, so it doesn't get worse as it sort of dies. And I've said this in the last video, and I say it again, I can honestly see these being floating contagion balls of death now because they're a 10-inch movement and they can fly. Whilst we're talking about fly, Winter's covered this. Demon Princes no longer fly 12 inches, they just get plus 2 inches to their movement, so they go up to 10, no longer 12. That's an important change. Just thought you guys would like to know about that one. But these can fly 10 inches and they have the contagion ability. So I can see people floating these forward with and advancing them and con with contagion ability to use them as minus one toughness auras in order to make the enemy minus one toughness. So when they hit them with their range firepower, including their bolt weaponry, you can suddenly be wounding space marines on threes with bolt guns. That's a big deal. 
Again, Flesh Mower, this thing has got a base of four attacks. Flesh Mowers are three attacks per attack. That's 12 attacks as well. So stick a Flesh Mower on it, fly it forward, off you go. Everyone's happy. Well, not everyone's happy. Your opponent probably isn't happy. But, oh well. Plague Burst Crawlers are as good as they were before, if not now better. Entropy Cannons are now Plague Weapons. And instead of D6 damage there, D3 plus 3 interesting that's a massive boon d3 plus three means you're doing a minimum of four damage and you could have done one damage in the past and it's a plague weapon so you can reroll to wound that is huge and then you look at the plague burst mortar no longer has a minimum range still heavy d6 but no longer has a minimum range flat two damage instead of d3 i think that's better I think that I would much rather have that consistent damage output rather than the swingy damage output. And what's really frightening with the Plague Burst Crawler is it's a stratagem that allows you to fire the Plague Burst Mortar in combat. I, I don't know why you would allow that, but they've allowed that. That's the thing, apparently. And then we have some standard units, Defiler, Land Raider, Predators. I'm not going to cover those. They're not that different. And I don't think we'll see many of those in Death Guard armies because the Death Guard specific units are just so good. And there's so many stratagems around them and, and ways you can combine uh, buffs to things like Plague Weapons. I just don't think you're going to see it. We move on to the final page. We've got Mortarian, who's an absolute monster. Covered it in the last codex. His data sheet was shown on the screen. He is supremely, supremely powerful. Um, and don't forget, he gets those three Warlord traits and the additional one. So he's quite tough. The thing that shocked me is he's 490 points. And I question whether a quarter of someone's Strike Force army, whether they're prepared to spend that on Mortarian. But he is a boss, he is an absolute animal, he's super tough now, toughness 8 like I said, I think he was toughness 7 previously, toughness 8 with 18 wounds, strength 8, um, 7 attack space, yeah I like it, he's really good, he's really powerful, he's got a ton of rules and like I say he also always counts the turn as being, um, being turn 4 so he's got a 9 inch contagion range ability no matter what. You've also got the Miasmic Malign... Malign Mal You've got the, the testicle terrain piece. The plague testicles. Plague testicles is what they're called. And I, mm, they're pushing fortifications. I'm not sure we'll see this with much with much use. Has Contagions of Nurgle. Has Disgustingly Resilient. It is Toughness 8 and 12 Wounds. I suppose this is something you could use as a Contagion bubble creator. and dump Because you can deploy it outside of your deployment zone. So you could dump it in the middle of the battlefield. Or on objectives, you could put this miasmic malign. Can you put it? Can you put it? I wonder if you could put it near a near a deployment zone. No, no. Hang on. Wait, wait, wait. So interesting. There's no limit on whether you could put this on or near objectives. So actually, you could deploy this miasmic. You could you could deploy the plague testicles near enemy objectives, and then if they were to move on to that objective, they suffer minus one toughness, and then you could pummel them from range. So maybe it will see use, possibly. I don't know. It's, that's a hard one because fortifications is something we haven't historically seen much of in 40k and I wonder if that's enough of a change to make people want to use it. Probably probably not. And that is a brief scan of the rules with some thoughts to the changes compared to 8th edition and how this book might be used and, and where it's good and where it's bad. That's the Death Guard Codex. Linked directly below will be a link to the Element Games website where you can pre-order your codex through Element Games and it's an, it's an affiliate link so using that affiliate link directly supports the channel and it supports deploymentzone.tv so thank you very much for you people that are using that link and once you're there chuck some Blight Lords in absolutely definitely chuck some Blight Lords in because they are going to be insanely good. Um, and I think the things like even the Death Guard new start collecting, which is called Combat Patrol, is pretty good value for money. There's 30 Poxwalkers, a unit of Plague Marines, Typhus in that box. It's probably worth looking at that box too and adding that to your cart once you've got your codex. But otherwise, that's it. That's all I'm going to cover. Like I said, if you want an in-depth review of the codex where we where all the stratagems are sort of read out to you and explained, along with most of the Warlord traits, most of the psychic powers, etc., then head on over to deploymentzone.tv and watch Winters's in-depth review. Um, if some of the rules haven't been covered, I didn't properly talk about this. Oh, I kind of did actually in the end cover them all. So you could watch the old video or, or don't because I've basically covered it all here. But in summary, 
I think the Codex is a lot, a lot better than the 8th edition Codex. I think Death Guard now, with the stratagems that I haven't covered, but they are in there, have a lot of ways of kicking out more damage, more mortal wounds, and basically being a lot scarier with that damage output. In 8th edition, I felt like it was a bit of a waiting game for Death Guard, and they just had to hope that they could soak up all the damage that the enemy would chuck at them and survive long enough. And I guess that's kind of narrative for Death Guard, but... They have always been famed for kicking out horrific diseases and plagues and, and really crippling the enemy by choking the atmosphere and filling it with filth and, and disgust. And I don't really I didn't really get that feeling from them in eighth edition. They kind of got the resilience right, maybe too much to some extent with the old disgustingly resilient rule. This is definitely better. I prefer the disgustingly resilient rule personally. I think it's just better across the board. And I do understand that last guns now are arguably as dangerous to Death Guard as to a point as two damage weapon. And okay, I, I take that point. I understand that point. And I get that point. But I just I prefer this. I think it's less rage inducing to play against. And then when you don't take it in its own little unique specific rule but you include all the additionals that they get with things like the contagion ability uh, that for me makes up for the change to disgustingly resilient i'd rather have new disgustingly resilient and contagion ability than old disgustingly resilient from a narrative perspective i understand that it's probably slightly worse in terms of resilience for competitive play yet again though you look at some of the other changes that we've seen increased base attacks uh, better weapon skill for demon engines um, all those different changes that exist now Really, really positive. Seven plague companies within the Codex. Loads of access to relics and warlord traits. The base relics page, the base relics page, not including the seven plague company relics, is the bit that I'm probably the most disappointed in because I just don't think it's very good. There's only eight there. But you do get seven more from the plague company, so maybe that makes up for it. I'm not sold that they're good enough, especially, like I said, when you consider the four of the specific types of character. That's If that's the only thing I've really got to whinge about in the whole Death Guard Codex... It's not that bad. Oh, and losing Chaos Boon and Death to the False Emperor. I liked Death to the False Emperor. I liked that rule. I liked saying it. It just made me happy saying it. Now I'm going to say it and I don't get to do anything when I'm saying it. But, yeah. If the Death Guard Codex is anything to go by for future Chaos Space Marine releases, I think it's really positive. Uh, Winters did mention that he would have liked to see more releases in terms of like vehicles and stuff for the Death Guard, and I agree with that, but... Maybe, just maybe, we'll see a new World Leaders release or a new Emperor's Children release, and that will make us happy. Emperor's Children first, maybe. I'm not sure. It does mean that it looks like it's positive and bright for the Chaos Space Marines in the future. The base Chaos Space Marine Codex, based on this, looks like it has the potential to be a very strong book, and maybe, maybe, it might even be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with its loyalist... Um, with its loyalist counterpart and that's something that really excites me so if you enjoyed this review if you liked it this is the new style i talked three weeks in a row three weeks in a row videos and this is my new stage look at it it's good isn't it three weeks three weeks did you think i'd do three weeks i wasn't even sure i would do it even though i promised it but this is the new review if you really want to support the channel the best way to support the channel is by heading to www.deploymentzone.tv and subscribing to deploymentzone.tv which is uh mine and winters from winters seos on demand channel um i'm now putting up regular sit and talk similar to this one every single friday on dctv winters releases a battle report every single tuesday on dctv we've got the new Four Horsemen of the Hobby Apocalypse series that started, which is like Four Gamers of the whatever they used to call it, the Four Gamers series, the Tale of Four Gamers, that's the one. The Tale of Four Gamers series is like that one. Um, Quips has started Fireside Chats, which is a chat show type sort of podcast thing with the shittest name in the history of video making but the content was really really good so he's got the fireside chat there's just loads going on and there's something very exciting coming very very soon you want to be in the deployment zone when this thing happens trust me i'm not lying you want to be there alternatively other ways of supporting the channel are by using the element games link listed below which is an affiliate link like i've said that supports deployment zone myself and winters as well and we get a 5% kickback for every purchase you make using that link. And you have to use that link for us to get that kickback. Thank you very much for everyone that's been using it and everyone that's bookmarked it to make sure they use it every time they click on the Element website. You guys are all heroes. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that about covers it. Um, let me know what you think of this type of review rather than just reading the rules, going through and telling you how it differs from before, how strong I think it is, etc. Because if it's popular, and it, I think it's different enough, then we'll do this more in the future. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.